Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure to participate um, in this forum with some thoughts on where we come from and where I think we should be going. My thoughts go back to the early 1990s, and that's one and a half decades ago already, when the dimensions and the potentially existential threats of damages to the global environment became visible. It was then time to plan to change course. And in fact, in June of 1992, as probably almost everyone here, or everyone here remembers, heads of states and heads of governments gathered at the Earth Summit in Rio and recognized the threats and the necessity to take action. Sustainable development was to become the guiding principle that should define the course of action of human civilization. It implied preventive action to avoid irreparable damage to our planetary habitat. While in the early days the concept was mainly oriented towards conserve, conserving natural resources, it gradually evolved to include social, economic, and institutional concerns. One of the results of Rio was the Framework Convention on Climate Change that aims at reducing emissions of greenhouse gases. It entered into force in 1994, and today almost all countries, with very few exceptions of this world, have adhered to it. But, as we all know, the necessary change, of course, did not happen. The world has largely continued over this 15 years since Rio with business as usual. Consumption-driven economies fueled by cheap fossil energy led to an unprecedented economic boom. China and other important uh, emerging economies joined the action in a rapidly globalizing world, adding to the dynamics of resource use at a clearly unsustainable level. Thus, let's recognize that over the past 15 years, we did not do what we knew we should be doing. As a global economy, we went in the opposite direction at an accelerating pace. Obviously, those of us who are leading in terms of wealth and technology should also have been leaders in innovation. Um, we should have shown the way for emerging economies to shape their own future. Now, the window of opportunity for preventive action is closing. As a result of climate change, substantial damage with unknown consequences to present forms of living seems unavoidable. The recently rele released reports by the IPCC leave little doubt that climate change is now happening and that it's largely man-made. As a consequence, what we acknowledged to be vitally important 15 years ago is now becoming equally urgent. Time is running short. We don't have the luxury anymore to carefully plan and gradually implement measures. The kind of measures that are required now to limit and mitigate damage will have to imply tougher choices. It's in a way saddening to think of all the great business opportunities we lost because we continued so long with the politics of cheap fossil fuel. In 1992, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development that I founded to organize input from business um, to the Earth Summit published our book, Changing Course. We defined eco-efficiency as one important element for successful business development in a world that would increasingly be resource constrained. And pioneering companies did see the challenge and decided to go for the inherent opportunities. Many of them achieved progress far beyond their wildest expectations. Together with progressive communities, scientists, and entrepreneurs working towards the same goals, they have established over the years a formidable body of experience, know-how, and expertise. We know today that it is possible to become vastly more efficient, and we have proven that it can be done successfully. World-leading companies such as DuPont, Toyota, Walmart, General Electric, and many others in many parts of the world 
demonstrate that eco-efficiency and social responsibility are part of a winning corporate strategy. But, another but, in order to get the best of the market and uh, of uh, entrepreneurship, we need political leaders and policymakers to give the right signals. Indeed, today many great initiatives are still hampered or being stalled by the wrong signals. Signals provided by policies that were shaped in times of cheap fossil fuels and of an atmosphere that we considered as a receptacle for unlimited amounts of greenhouse gases. Let's hope that the people of, and nations of this world will now definitely wake up and learn from the experience of the past 15 years. We must no longer waste time and opportunities. And we must not wait for others, such a, as a federal government, to take the lead. Non-governmental actors might prove more proactive and more effective. We used to be worried when we talked about sustainable development, we talked about future generations. It seems to me that as the consequences of our lack of resolve in the recent past are catching up with us, we now need to begin to think about present generations. Huge and increasingly affluent numbers of new consumers will begin to participate in the global economy. Demand keeps growing exponentially. We will be living in a world that will rapidly become determined by scarcity of resources. Over our history, we humans have learned to deal with scarcities of resources fundamentally in three ways. One, to use them more efficiently and to reduce consumption. Two, to negotiate and to allocate uh, quotas and um, uh, negotiate solutions between competing parties. And number three, by conflict. Use force to secure one's own supply to the detriment of competitors. It seems safe to predict that the number three scenario, the conflict scenario, will become a default scenario if we don't make sufficient progress with the first two options. And it is already happening now as larger economies rush to secure access to the remaining resource of oil. I do feel that important parts of the world are finally, for someone who has participated in Rio, finally reaching the tipping point of awareness about the challenges facing us. Responsible people don't see climate change any longer as a green fad, but rather as an existential threat. They want their government, their community, their company, their family to get involved in taking action. In an increasingly resource-constrained world, Latin America's competitive position could actually improve, provided proper policies are put in place, which will assure that we make good use of the rich natural endowment we enjoy. Legislators and governments, business entrepreneurs, and leaders of civil society should now join forces to making such policies acceptable, at least palatable, for the public. Together, we need to make sure that we translate resource wealth into high productivity rather than high waste. As natural resources become valuable, they should not become resources for short-term cash, as it has been the case in many oil-rich countries. Rather, they should be sources of social change and economic and environmental progress. For me, the participation in the process running up to Rio 92 was a intensive and uh, extremely enriching personal experience. It taught me many interesting lessons. And unlike many others, I believed in what I saw and understood, and I decided to take action. So, one year later, 1993, I founded the Avena Foundation to facilitate societal processes 
leading to more sustainable forms of development. Avina to date has supported more than 1,500 social entrepreneurs in a broad array of activities ranging from resource management and conservation to democratic participation, the rule of law, equity of opportunity and many others. Recently, a new emphasis has been put on facilitating networks of social leaders, allowing them mutual learning and collective action. Ten years later, in 2003, I donated the equity of my Latin American business to the irrevocable Viva Trust that now assures the financial continuity of the learning exercise that I have launched and of the organizations I have created. The main asset of the trust is Masisa, a Chilean-based uh, forestry company, marketing wood products across the Americas produced from sustainably managed plantations and from recycled wood residues. Masisa obviously measures its performance at the triple bottom line of economic, social, and ecological performance. I'm proud to say that to the best of my awareness, the Viva Trust is among the biggest private donations Latin America has ever received. But Viva is not a conventional charitable gift. Rather, it is a new organizational structure trying to combine the respective strengths of business and philanthropy. As a radical example of innovation, I hope it could serve as an inspiration and an incentive for others to make their own experiments. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we all know that the development model we have tried in the past decades in Latin America worked only partially. Yes, it did create wealth, but it led to an ever-widening gap between the rich and the poor that cannot go on forever. And it did take a heavy toll on many ecosystems in Latin America. And in the past, Latin America has been one of the settings where the Cold War turned hot and resulted in revolution and dictatorship as frequent responses to its problems. I think the region may be at risk again, as already drums of conflict can be heard. Given these perspectives, the continent's wealthy entrepreneurs should more proactively contribute to generating new responses that will allow Latin America to break with its past patterns of political and social instability. If we want to avoid the conflict scenario number three that I mentioned in dealing with future scarcities, we need to learn to work together across the divides between the haves and the have-nots for the mutual benefits of all. I'm aware that the required change in attitude is both important and urgent to avoid the collapse of the social fabric and of the natural systems. But I'm convinced that we can find ways to a rosier future if we get the best of business and of organized civil society to collaborate towards um, finding sustainable forms of development. Thank you. <laughs>